Before we get too deep into spectroscopy, I do want to give sort of an overview on how waves work in general and just give a little bit more of a general idea as to what someone will be looking at when they are doing spectroscopic analysis. In the book, they do a very poor job saying where all the wavelengths would be laid out if you were to try and use spectroscopic analysis to visualize wavelengths on a screen. It'd be very unclear as to where each of those wavelengths would be located. So I'm going to provide insight, some insights into how this entire thing would actually play out. And with that being said, let us begin. So basically, I'll expect that you kind of already know something about superposition. If you don't, the brief gist of it is, is that the properties of two things are additive. Like we, if we have a wave source that starts at this origin and, and basically creates ripples from this point, it will basically add to any other waves that might be traveling in any other direction. Um, so if we, you can imagine that if we had a wave that went this way and it peaked right about here, we would expect another peak um, of higher amplitude right there, right? So basically the amplitudes add up um, to greater and greater amounts as you just, you know, add more waves to it, right? But basically, though, if we add, add uh, two of these, it becomes a little bit hard to visualize, but basically just know that everything's adding together and note that the values of this can be positive or negative, as you can see there, like we're getting a value of positive one right there and then a negative one about at this trough for this blue one, but also we're getting about a... um. A positive right a positive one at about the same point with the red so or is that an orangey color I don't know I'm colorblind what's your excuse um, <laughs> so let's see the we have this red so yeah we've got this red and blue and they should be canceling so that means that we would expect the sum of function a and function B to be zero at about this point right here. So let's see if that's right. It's so hard to see when you have this many graphs. Uh, let's see, uh, it's so hard to tell. A. Was that it? I forget which point. Uh, I've already forgotten. Okay, so this lighter blue, I think, is... Yeah, because the purple's going to be, of course, a higher amplitude. Yeah, I think that I just thought that this red was a little bit further back. Um, and a little bit more centered on top of this blue right here. Is there a better example of this? I guess this would be... Oh, that still looks like it might be additive. Uh, might be subtractive. I don't know. Let's check. I'm guessing right here it should be subtractive, right? It should be close to zero at around this point, I think, right here. Uh, need to remove the other graphs. Uh, that looks pretty close to zero. Yeah, that looks about right. Yeah, oh my god, that's almost dead on, actually. Good, 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 good. Um, so first I just wanted to get a good idea of how, um, how interference patterns work for a simple double slit experiment. That way, um, cause the entire goal of this is to try and, uh, understand what diffraction gratings are doing and how they're creating interference patterns. I'm going to try to zoom in so we get a little bit of detail back. Um, it's a little bit hard with GeoGebra cause you can... You have to realize that it throws away detail the farther away you get from the graph, and so it can kind of be a little bit of a difficulty to try and figure out how close you need to get to find the resolution that you want. Um, 
But you can see though that you have these sort of maximums and then these places where there's no where there's no maximum at all, right? It's like it fluctuates between maximums and minimums. So basically I named this S because this is my basically simulated screen. Um, if you saw a wave coming in, it would basically deposit um, an amount of energy here. Whereas like two waves right here, they would cancel. The waves are having to almost always cancel on this pathway here, so you won't see much of anything at all. It's like the... Uh, and so you can kind of get this sort of very nice pattern that kind of happens. And so the big thing though that I wanted to do was I was just like, hmm, now is there a way to calculate where each of these maxima are? Because, um, this kind of gives you an idea of where they, um, of in the textbook they reference this. Uh, what was it? I think it was something like d sine of theta is equal to. What was it? I think it was d sine of theta equals n times lambda. I think that that's right. Yeah. So basically, I wanted to understand what the order number was. When we start to figure out like why um, red and blue peak at different locations, why different wavelengths will peak at different locations, um, we first need to know how to calculate the maximum at different um, places, right? We need to figure out where these, where we're going to get the brightest points on this screen, right? And so we've already got this green at a set value of 50. So basically we can treat that as just like a constant that we know because we can choose that beforehand, however far away we have our screen, right? <clears throat> now, let us go to, let's go here. And so basically though, I basically had to create a bunch of curves that would line up along these different paths. When I was first trying to figure this out, I kind of thought a little bit about this for a sec um, in terms of how I would solve this problem mathematically. Um, and then I kind of thought about like, oh, you can kind of just think of, oh, it's wherever these two will um, get the same value, basically. When when will the sine waves have the same, I guess, in this case, z value, right? Because it's like, like, you expect that even though uh, there's some intersection, they're going to have some intersection upon the xy, but you also know that they're going to have the same uh, z as well, which is determined by this cosine function over here, right? This cosine function is what's generating our z values in this curve. It'd be pretty obvious that these would um, intersect at this exact point right here, right? Because it's like, it's traveling the same distance, they don't overlap the screen at the same time, they're both um, the same distance away from the origin, I basically deliberately constructed these to be the same distance away from the origin. Um, so basically they're uh, the source of each of these individual waves, right, is located at, as you will see, is located at 10. And you can see that they that this is correct. And, and it took me a while to verify this, where I had to verify that it was correct by just making sure that they lined up with whatever um, they were being emitted from, whichever, you know, wave they were being emitted from, um, wave source they were being emitted from. That sounds confusing. Um, so let's go back to B, and you can see that the exact same thing happens over here. The Like I said, you can see 10 right there. Uh, can I get this? Yeah, there we go. Negative 10 right here. And I tr kept the x value as an unknown, but I knew that the uh, that 
these equations had to be equal to each other. But the problem is, is that when you just set the equations equal to each other, the only actual solution I got that actually made sense was where uh, x equaled zero, which I mean, which I mean makes sense. That's this solution right here. But it was weird to me at the time because it was just kind of like, huh, that's not really what I'm expecting because I already knew that there was a peak there. Then I kind of went on to Khan Academy. And Khan Academy gives you a little bit of a better understanding about it because you basically go, uh, it's where I kind of got this idea where, oh, it's about where the, um, the lines line up. And they only really, the video that I saw from Khan Academy really only demonstrated um, two-dimensional, not three-dimensional like this, but it did still give me an idea. It was like, oh, so basically what I'm looking for is, um, we'll see constructive interference whenever these are, whenever this wavelength has to travel an entire wavelength further than this one, which makes sense in a weird way. If you're trying to like, if you're trying to get the wavelength to line up, right? Well, obviously they're gonna line up whenever they travel the same distance, right? But then, and to understand when they're going to line up, up um, what the other distance is that they're going to have to line up, they're going to have to go an entire full wavelength away. It's really useful to kind of visualize these in terms of like uh, Pythagorean, the Pythagorean theorem, where we're just taking some rise over run or the origin. And in this case, we're doing two of them to try and, because um, obviously you need one from this location and one from this location. So you're getting two different hypotenuse. Um, hopefully this will help explain it. And so yeah, here's the first technique that I tried, and it didn't work at all. So, I mean, this is where I got um, not yeah, it really wasn't helpful. It's like what I got. Oh right, everything canceled except for the twenty. We got forty, and that kind of gets you. Yeah, the only thing that I got there was x equals zero, which, like I said, is not helpful. Um. Let's see. I luckily I wrote down all my reasoning here. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so if both slits emit the same wavelength of light, then the constructive interference will happen whenever the wavelength of one slit. Because, right, this is to model two different slits, and I'm kind of modeling them like they create a circular ripple um, that kind of emanates. So each wave is like a circular um, uh, maximum or minimum, basically. Maximum, minimum, maximum, minimum. That's the sort of wave that's being emanated. Think of, like, um, a buoy bobbing down up in a pond and how that would create ripples from its center. So I'm basically modeling slits like that. I don't know if that's the exact form, but I feel like that the concept will still help us see what's going on with diffraction. I don't know if that's the exact form. Maybe someone who has done the experiment knows a little bit better than I, um, if this is anything close to the actual um, shape of which the wavelengths form from the center. And also, I think that it's probably unrealistic that um, it doesn't it doesn't uh, fade, you know? The, the amplitudes don't get smaller as it emanates from this central point, which is probably a little unrealistic. But I don't think that we should care too much about that because we're, um, we're doing quantum mechanics anyways, and the idea is that we're supposed to be finding things of which you can't divide them any further. So these waves might be like a certain way of viewing a photon or something like that. 
So constructive interference must. So basically, notice though that in the case that I created though, uh, I haven't edited the actual frequency of this at all, right? Um, <clears throat> so that means that um, since I haven't edited the frequency, right? Because you kind of know what the um, an unaltered frequency of a wave looks like. Like we're basically taking the square root of the squares because I'm. Uh, it's a circular form. It's a little bit more complex. Ten minus four equals six. There we go. I think that I said that right. <laughs> okay, but basically, if you go, that's like. Um, that's an, that, that's basically six though. Um, and you want to know what else is really close to six? Two pi. And that makes perfect sense because basically when you have an unaltered frequency, you are using unit circle units. When you take cosine of zero, you get one. And then when you take cosine of two pi, you get one because you travel all the way around the unit circle, right? So we've completed a full cycle here and it makes sense because we haven't really altered the frequency in any way. We've just altered the actual form of which the wave takes. We basically have waves that um, have a wavelength of two pi, right? So this, will, this is crucial because It'll help us a little bit with generating a general form later. So basically though, my wavelength is two pi. If I wanna have constructive interference, I need one wave to travel a full wavelength further than the other wave. So they fully line up again. Once I learned this, it became incredibly straightforward to figure out how I was going to derive this formula. Okay, so basically, let's think about this though. So say that we want these to constructively interfere at the same point. Well, this means that we're creating an intersection between um, between these two waves. So we're measuring at some intersection. So, and we're going to measure these from the origin of each, right? And of course, they're going to overlap at the same point, right? So they're going to share this common um, x value, so they're going to share this corner right here. And we also know that they're actually going to share this same side right here. If we've got just a flat screen and, you know, they're just both slits are oriented just towards the screen, both going to be located 50 units away. So that's why I get this 50 term that's right here. Hypotenuse 1 is equal to hypotenuse two plus two pi. So let's see, that means that this is hypotenuse two, right? Because hypotenuse two plus two pi is equal to this hypotenuse. Because remember that this has to be, um, this has to travel one full wavelength longer than this one. We can use Pythagorean's theorem here because hypotenuse one will just be um, hypotenuse one equation it would just be, you know, side one plus 50 squared, um, right? And then hypotenuse two would just be um, the side two squared plus 50 squared. So side two would be. Um, this one right here and know that there's there's this equivalence because remember that like right now I'm kind of defining it in kind of my coordinates in kind of a weird way I'm doing it based off of the sides and not based off of where the origin is so um, remember that s2 needs to have a plus 20 draw where the origin was, it'd be down here, of course, my bad, but if we were to draw a line to the screen, it'd be to that same spot, you know what I mean? Because basically what we're doing here is this is 
uh, 10 meters away. And then, I mean, not 10 meters, I mean, just 10 units. It's like, this is just a mathematical formula, right? We haven't defined what our units are. But, and obviously, proportionally, I'm sure the scale that I chose is kind of weird. But if I were to make everything to scale, we'd be dealing with... Um, <laughs> like something that's only a couple hundred nanometers or something like that, if we're dealing with real light, um, like just visible light especially. So I decided to just do a scaled up version. But yeah, that makes sense. So basically though, I've got my hypotenuse one equation, my hypotenuse two equation. Basically my entire goal here is to just make it so we can solve for one of the S's, S1 or S2, because as soon as we solve for one of them, we can just use this formula to solve for the other. Yeah, I decided to basically just keep this as S1, and then I put this as H2 plus 2 pi, right? Um, so basically, yeah, then I had to just go and, okay, we have a formula for S1, Let's go and substitute H2, which, you know, that's this formula right here. So if we substitute for H2, we get, uh, remember that we said H2 was equal to that. You take the square root of both sides, you get um, square root of S squared. So basically you get just the square root of this side equation and you take the square root of both sides and then you can plug that as H2, right? So plug that into H2, you get that. Add your 2 pi, boom. Um, just because, you know, that's what we had before. Oh yeah, then I substituted S1 for S2. That way I had completely S1. Then you just had to go through all the freaking work of solving for S1. And boy, oh boy, does that take, that's a lot of tedious work. And I got to this, which I just plugged into a calculator. I actually did try to make, like when I generalized this formula, I did try and make it look nicer, but it ended up being that I just kept introducing more errors as I was trying to do it. So maybe I'll find a way to clean up this formula and try and make it as simple as possible. So that means that, let's see, we know that this is a point and then we know that we need it to intersect at a place where pi, whoops, dome, dome. And then as you can see, that looks about right. You can kind of see that maybe it looks a little bit weird, but you also see how weird this destruction portion of it becomes. This glow actually matches up where the waveforms are canceling out a little bit. So you can kind of see that it kind of travels up a little bit. So it actually makes sense that it's kind of pushed a little bit more this way. <clears throat> you know? So that's why, though. And as you can see, it lines up pretty much exactly. I mean, it does line up exactly where the, that maximum is, right? So... Um, and the thing is, is that, like, you might be confused, but it's like, wait, there's two solutions that we actually get here um, when you look at this, because we get the plus, or we can take the plus or minus of this equation. That's two different solutions. Well, that's the interesting thing. I didn't realize this until I was punching this into the calculator, but the two solutions that you get actually correspond to one solution from each origin so it tells you uh, kind of um as you can kind of see by the adjustments that i had to make here you can also so you can see that that's six right um this value is just six right and then you can actually see that this value right here is 26 and what do you know that's like exactly 20 offset from the origin which makes a lot of sense that we're getting x values that are offset by 20 
from each other because you know that's how spaced so that's a really good sign that everything is working out as according to plan okay great we found the we found basically what is the zero of the order um maximum right here and we found the first order how do we find more orders though because you can kind of count these and actually kind of see what's going on here a little bit you can see that um let's actually not i'm going to count everything excluding the uh the starting point so i'm not counting the actual starting point but let's count the peaks one two three four five six seven eight and just about nine right there and then one oh wait no i said i wasn't counting this one two three four five six seven eight so as you can see this is traveling one entire full wavelength more than this one is and as you can see i to double check if they line up it's as simple as um it's as simple as let's take that away and just looking at this oh look it lines up perfectly with this one and the one from the other origin still lines up perfectly with this one so i got those to line up perfectly um if you're wondering why i had to make these really weird adjustments to the frequency and why i had to this i guess y value right um i did an entire video on rotating uh these so i'll put a link to that in the description if you're curious about why i had to make these little adjustments so we found the zeroth order and we found the first order of constructive interference you can see that we still have more orders to find so what would we do? We would simply do the same thing, but instead we're going to do two full wavelengths, which in this case would be four pi units, right? So the hypotenuse needs to be an entire four pi units longer. You go through that entire process again, and then you will arrive at... So yeah, then we shall find... Boom. All right. And the big question here is that, like, is there another one? Because it's really hard to tell whether there is. Well, actually, maybe there is a way to tell. Yeah, no, you really can't. Because as you zoom in, it, it's really hard to tell whether. Um, I guess maybe you can see a slight dip, indicating that we're just on the edge of having another, um, another order. So maybe you can tell, but it's really hard to tell whether we get another order. But in fact, we do. It's the same thing. We get a third order. Um, so boom, boom. But as you can see, you have to go way the hell out there before that ever reaches the screen. I'm into my desired location. Okay, there we go. Boom. Boom. Okay. So yeah, you had to go really way out there to try and get this to freaking to find the location where this intersects with the screen. And as you can see, we got it though. We found the location. Uh, thank God, because that one's um, that's actually one of the ones where it may be easier to calculate it because it's really hard to eyeball where that location is. Um, so basically though it's like well why does it only have three um why can't we have a fourth one and i think that part of it might actually have to do with the equation that we just derived like we can kind of see why it doesn't do that anymore all of a sudden like one it just doesn't make any sense is like if we were to pick one that was even farther out right it's like would it ever meet up with the screen like if we zoom in on like just the pattern that's happening over this way right yeah it's like anything further out and it's just like there's no sign that 
it would ever line up with the screen at all. That it it never reached the screen. So basically, we couldn't even use this value of fifty because um, maybe you could start getting the other side of things if you used negative fifty. I don't feel like we need to prove that you could basically do this experiment in the opposite direction and still get the same results. The entire thing that I want to point out though is that so I think that this term actually ends up being pretty consistent. Well actually no it's squared so it's always positive. So never mind what I was about to say. Um, that entire thing is squared so it's always positive because remember this is basically just this is just basically just a giant quadratic equation, a quadratic formula, right? So that's our a right there, and then c is this giant thing over here, right? So that means that anytime this ends up being a negative in sign but bigger in magnitude than this, the more um, we won't get it because this entire, because then this entire, because then we'd be taking the square root of a negative number. But basically though, that shows you when you're going to get no solution because obviously um, if you get an imaginary number, you can't just, add it to this real term, at least not in the sense of which we're talking about, like that not in terms of where we can actually map stuff, where we can map um, where the maximums are. But yeah, so basically though, we've kind of justified how we're getting these, um, how we're getting these maximums at these different locations on the screen and how to even calculate them from just raw intuition, even though it is quite the calculation to try and derive this sort of pattern from first principles. But I kind of want to just look at this though, because this kind of already, what did we say it was? It was D, where D is the spacing between that D sine theta is equal to N lambda. Interesting. Okay, so that tells you what order. I guess if you divided by lambda, you could figure out what order you were looking at. If you divided by the order number, which is more likely, you could see what wavelength you're looking at. It gets too confusing right now though, because right now we're literally only looking at, we're really only looking at a single wavelength and how it constructively uh, and destructively interferes in a double slit interference pattern. Uh, yeah, what I kind of wanted to demonstrate, because I think that the way that I ended up doing this in terms of once I actually did a double slit of of um, more collimated light, collimated as in like uh, it has uh, multiple wavelengths of light in it, because of the properties of superposition of waves and stuff like that, view anything that's a little bit more complex as just the sum of these individual ones, as you can see this red one and this blue one. So yeah, they superimpose upon each other, they constructively interfere in some places, and then they deconstructively interfere in others. But the thing is, is that it's a lot easier to break this problem up and just look at the interference of the individuals of these. We're basically just making it easier to work with by dealing with one individually um, and then just kind of understanding how things are like, um, that it's like, oh, this is really the superposition of two different wavelengths. Um, okay. So let's play with these. So a little bit to show you again what's going on, just because it never hurts to repeat this stuff. So we have red 
In fact, I don't think I need to show you this because I think that I showed it all to you in that. But basically, you know, we it's like red, blue, um, purple is the superposition of these red and blue wavelengths. This is kind of interesting to think about because normally when you think about purple uh, in terms of just science, I feel like that you just think of it as just a higher frequency, you know, closer to the um, UV. To some extent, we kind of created this purple accidentally. Amplitudes are a little bit more complicated than normal. Kind of curious now whether if we just kind of followed found a frequency pattern that roughly lines up with this, whether it'd be really close to purple. Because we do kind of see this emerging pattern, even though the uh, frequency is... Because remember that the frequency slash wavelength is kind of what um, makes the color not whatever amplitude. First, I did try, I think, to try and explain this in terms of P1 and P2. But that's too complicated. I think that the easiest way to do this is to just keep it separated. Because you have this. This becomes kind of unwieldy, as you can kind of see here. But it looks like you can actually kind of see where the blue and the red separate, actually. I feel like I can kind of see that it's like... This looks different than this and they kind of travel through each other which is a formation that we didn't have with a single wavelength that's kind of interesting actually and we've got this artifact that's over here and this artifact let's just keep going um it's interesting to kind of see the that how that pattern all merges together but basically, though, we can still view this as a problem as broken up between red and blue, which is the way that I actually understood this. So be prepared. We have the red interference pattern. So that'll be my RT, my R total, right? And then we have the blue interference pattern, which is my blue total, right? So we've got an interference pattern for blue and an interference power an interference pattern for red there we go the interesting thing is that you'll notice that um i think what is it 2 pi is like let's see 3.14 so yeah 62 6.28 right so you'll notice that this actually is not too far off this frequency is not too far off from our um high radian example, right? It's just a little bit different. And the reason why I chose these is because um, they're kind of good analogs for how different blue and red are in the visible spectrum. Because yeah, blue is a much shorter wavelength, aka a much higher frequency. 475 nanometers is blue light, um, and 675 nanometers is red light. So you can see that um, red is almost double. It's not quite double blue. Um, otherwise, it'd be, what, it'd be closer to 900? If red had half the frequency or twice the wave wavelength of blue, I feel like something interesting would happen, but it's not perfectly that way. But basically, we need to start calculating, though, where these, where the red uh, maximum are and where the blue maximum are. So um, I'm not even going to pay attention to um, this center section here. We both know that both of them are going to constructively interfere at this Point right here, which is why this is the zero. It doesn't, um, the interference right here is the same, is literally just the same as having the light on top of each other, which is the same thing that we had before the light passed through the slits in the first place. It's not useful in splitting the wavelengths because remember, that's the entire thing that we're trying to understand. We're trying to understand how we get 
wavelengths of, of light to split apart from each other. So from the nature of the fact that um, blue is a shorter wavelength, of course, that's going to constructively interfere first because this hypotenuse does not have to be that much longer than this hypotenuse. You know, it's like simply due to the fact that blue is a shorter wavelength. And you can see that um, that when we look at the amount of, and if you're asking how I calculated all of this, I actually generalized this formula because I realized that this was going to be too much of a mess to try and do with two colors. And yeah, this is where I tried to clean. I think everything down here is where I tried to clean it up. Uh, no, I think I started cleaning it up here. No, this is where I started trying to clean it up. Um, this is what I ended up actually plugging into my calculator because I'm not going to get into it right now. Something about my math is off right here. And it's hard because I wasn't doing a scratch piece of paper. I was doing this by trying to cleverly delete things in the most efficient way. And honestly, I'm using Word for this. And Word is such bad software for actually... Um, Word is not good software for trying to edit formulas. I wish that they had better tools for this. It's so not intuitive and a pain in the butt, but I wanted to have this proof written down somewhere. So uh, I know that there's some mistakes that are lying maybe in here. I haven't checked, but there's somewhere in this section, basically. These are, this is somewhere where my mistakes are. Um, everything seems to be lining up correctly still with this formula. Um, this is the formula that I actually used calculate all of this. Maybe I should give a little bit more thorough explanation. So basically D is the slit separation. So basically the distance of which the slits are separated apart. Y naught is basically the distance from the screen to the midway point of the slit. So basically the distance from the screen to the origin. Um, I wanted to say midpoint of the slits because I feel like that it that applies generally like you could choose to define the origin somewhere else and so i wanted to make it a little bit more generic um to um our circumstance but basically then w is just whatever wavelength we have i wanted to say wavelength instead of frequency because technically our wave is not moving and frequency um implies something very specific for a traveling wave. And it's just the order number, so that makes sense and all that. The order doesn't seem that significant right now, but it actually, once we understand how this all works, it's going to mean something a little bit more impressive, I feel like, once we have defined what this order number is. So yeah, we went through all our blues. Now let us go and analyze all the reds. But yeah, you saw there though that we had um, first order, second order, third order, fourth order. So we got fourth order, right? Remember this is zeroth order right here. So we've got four orders for blue and Remember how I was saying that red is kind of similar to um, that single slit that we were doing before? Well, turns out like that, that sent off some alarm bells because we have, with that other wavelength, we actually have more orders than we do with red. For this one, I don't think that I even had a third one. And I think that when you look at this too, it doesn't have that slight dip back down, I don't think. I think it just becomes a maximum. I think that might have something to do with it. It doesn't... Yeah, I don't think that dips back down at all. Which I think is some indicator that we'd never hit the maximum. Or maybe we happen to choose a wavelength where 
where x would have to be infinity for it to reach here. Would that be the right way of expressing that? I don't know. That seems like a weird way of expressing that. And so what if we start mapping these together? Like, let's take a look at some of the blues while we're looking at some of the reds. Okay, so this is blue, this is red. And then you can see that we're gonna get another blue. So blue, red, blue. red, blue, so blue, red, blue, red, blue, and then blue. And that's mostly because it's like the, uh, we're not getting any, um, we're not getting any more orders for red interference anymore. We can kind of define these almost as like super orders in a way. All of a sudden you end up in a situation where it's like the higher order that you're able to observe, the more separated the, your wavelengths are going to be. Well, these ones are actually pretty close together, but that's mostly by accident because remember blue, red, blue, so this is really the red that it's neighbored with. And so you, you'd imagine that everything in between would be spread out around through here, through these wavelengths, right? So <clears throat> you'd imagine that the separation in this region would be quite big um, in comparison to these other locations. When we talk about diffraction gratings, it seems like that there's a few different kinds of diffraction gratings. I'm going to focus on the diffraction gratings that have holes in them. Jesus, yeah, as you can see, I pu pushed that um, pushed that screen out to 200 just so I can freaking see what the heck is going on here. Um, and it's still honestly so ungodly to look at. It throws away so much resolution when you're trying to do this. What you guys just saw was my attempt to... Uh understand what happens when you add more and more slits to basically constructively and destructively interfere with each other and try and see what happens to the order pattern. And as you saw, it just ends up kind of being a mess and doesn't show you really anything that helps you figure out what's going on. And so I think you get the premise though of how, um, light diffracts depending on its wavelength and so I kind of just wanted to go through and show a little bit of what some of the findings that I had online were um, because basically there's a lot of different kinds of diffraction gratings that all operate off of different principles like this right here that I'm uh, found on Qora is basically a light source um, that's basically using a whole bunch of slits to just constructively and destructively interfere. And that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to see whether if as we added more and more slits, we would kind of approach this sort of solution where we get um, just two first order diffraction patterns on each side of the zero border. What I was trying to see whether that would happen. Um, when I zoomed in on GeoGebra and really tried to uh, look at it, I think I maybe saw two, but like the way that it was constructively and destructively interfering, it was so hard to tell what was going on that it just, it just, I just couldn't tell it wasn't really possible. And so basically though, this I think articulates what we're supposed to see really well when we're using that kind of diffraction method to try and see when you're trying to see like double slit experiments. But you can kind of see though that this is the zeroth order, this is the first order, this is the uh, second order, right? And each time it spreads out 
a little bit more, right? So some also use um, just more of reflection and the fact that different frequencies of light reflect at different angles. I'm not exactly sure which ones which and there's a whole bunch of ways that you can try and optimize that. As you can see, they did a pretty good job at making this like the closest distance that happens, as you can see. Um, Cause now they've arranged it in such a way where um, this first order diffraction is going to be the brightest thing on the screen. I guess technically it, just the fact that all the wavelengths are landing in a more focused spot is um, technically brighter just because of that nature. But as you get further from the screen, everything gets dimmer, right? Um, as the light has to travel farther, which makes sense because, you know, the... Um, the farther you get from the screen, the number of photons hitting it will effectively be distributed across a larger area, basically. It's also a little weird though, because it kind of flies in the face of this diagram because, you know, it's basically just got high voltage discharge tube excites gases, right? Um, and, but this makes it seem like that each order is associated with a different wavelength, which I don't think that's how that works. But yeah, here's another example. And apparently this is like, I don't know the names of all these gradings, but apparently this is, um, um, this I think is the dispersion grading, which kind of is basically using the angles and you can kind of see that like if we were having a flat screen, right? It's like we would end up once again with a situation where the first order diffracted would be the brightest instead of the zeroth order. So you can see that there's a lot of room to play with um, trying to put like depending on where the screen is located and how the screen's angled and with respect to um, this grading, you can really play with getting an arrangement where your first order, second order, third order ends up being the brightest thing that you see just by the nature of the fact that it's closer. That's going to be all. I hope that this kind of cleared a little bit up on what diffraction gratings are used for and kind of what principles of light that they use. When you have collimated light from some source that's just made of a bunch of different frequencies of wavelengths, you can use the properties of the frequencies and wavelengths of light to see the entire distribution of the wavelengths and display them out on a screen in order. And this will help us later when we're trying to do spectroscopic analysis. Hopefully this was a useful video. Um, <laughs> I didn't mean for it to be this long, but you know, it's, um, I think the payoff will be really worth it because now I understand a little bit more about what's going on in terms of the constructive and destructive interference and why we'd expect this sort of rainbow on a screen. And, um, and so now we can start actually applying that to quantum mechanics and trying to figure out, okay, what does it mean when one of those wavelengths or several of those wavelengths are missing, AKA there's gaps in the spectrum. With that being said, I'll see you in the next video.